Hi all, there's quite a few juicy games coming out of the Tatar Steel tournament. One of them is the Anand win in round 4 against Wang Hao. Let's have a quick look at that game. So Anand kicked off with d4. And the theme of this game I would say is sacrificially repairing uh, your own pawn structure. Quite a remarkable transformation in Anand's pawn structure here demonstrated. Uh, so we have a Nimzo engine which in itself, you know, black's already aiming to damage white's pawn structure, inflicting the old doubled pawns, which Nimzovich has, has talked about a lot. And the main line, knight c3, for some reason in this Tatar tournament has been a lot more popular than knight f3. I don't know if it's a new version of Ribka and people are finding fantastic new dynamic ideas, but it's weird. I really think this is weird how knight c3, the popularity has... Uh, mushrooms in this tournament. So allowing this, the seemingly crippling, um, you know, Nimzovich idea, you know, double the pawns, restrain blockades, uh, destroy on, on this pawn when these pawns are doubled. But we have already, you know, a legacy of dynamic ideas in the Nenza engine. And uh, one of them is is like losing development time uh, with the Simish like construction, trying to, you know, get this this pawn structure in the center, trying to get control of e4 with a pawn. But, you know, it's temporarily weakening the dark squares. But if, if black's going to lose the dark square bishop, that's not an issue in theory. But look at, you know, white's lag in development here. When he kicks the bishop now with a3, not one piece developed. But um, Anand has got a very, very interesting idea here. So accepting the shattered pawn structure. So at the moment, you know, isolated pawn, double pawns, lack of development. Fine. So black tries to break the center, increases development, put his pieces, uh, putting a lot of pressure, you know, for potential exchanges like CD or D take C options. So a lot of tension already. But we have already this legacy of a dynamic idea here. C takes, and then this capturing away from the center, which seems to cripple white's pawn structure even more. Total fragmentation here. And also C3, but there's a tactical issue with C3. White can afford to play E4 here. Uh, you know, queen c3, um, then bishop d2. If knight c3, then queen d2 and bishop b2. So that's not the issue, though. But the issue is the long-term issue, you know, the crippling of the pawn structure here. So Anand shows not only, you know, temporarily this pawn is eyeing these two key squares, which is kind of annoying, and there's d-file pressure. This bishop's a bit hemmed in on c8. We see this pawn maintained now, bishop e3. Forget about this pawn, because then king f2 of queen c3, followed by rook c1 maybe. So black castled. And we also see some compensation here in terms of the b and d files, actually. The b file, in particular now, is used. Queen b3, forget about um, developing these pieces for the moment. Anand's concerned exerting maximum pressure on the b file, trying to hem in this bishop, you know, give it a hard time for developing. Queen c7. And now we see a very interesting move as well, bishop b5. So not developing the bishop behind one of these two pawns. It looks a bit poxy there. Anyway, it would be a target on the d file. On c4, you know, maybe that, that would have been considered. But, you know, things like knight c6 would threaten knight a5 on those two guys. So bishop b5 also carries some positional venom. If it encourages a6, then what are we weakening with a6? We're weakening b6. And the b file, you know, white's already got pressure on the b file. So to encourage b6 is a good idea. So bishop b5. Knight e c6. Awkward development from black. Not using these two guys yet. Seems a bit uncomfortable. He's eyeing the e5 square, of course, with the knight. Doesn't have to worry about the knight, you know, keep keeping on f6 to protect h7. That's not an issue at all in the position. The issue is, you know, the fragmented pawn structure here and try and get these pieces developed for black. Knight e2. And then we see knight a5. So black's trying to use that sensitive, potentially sensitive c4 square as well. But now an annoying move, an incredibly annoying move, but really fits in with the needs of the position, I think. Queen b4, seemingly clinging on further, an iron grip on the c5 pawn, echoing d6, echoing a5 pressure, echoing the b-file pressure as well. So, it's not easy for black, maybe, to untangle, but e5 would seem to simply liberate the bishop a little bit. Okay. And then now castled, nothing special about that. Bishop e6. And now, okay, these two pawns have been useful for the, you know, this one in particular, for, for usefully eyeing, you know, these two squares and trying to delay black's development. But now we have, I think, 
a theoretical prepared novelty by Anand, which shows the great dynamism of chess and an almost like magic like trick in sacrificially repairing one's own pawn structure to increase the dynamism and pressure of that pawn structure. Because at the moment, okay, apart from this pawn eyeing those two key squares and white's got some, some temporary, you know, D, B and D file pressure, these pawns are not really doing that much together as an attacking unit. But this next move changes all that. I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 10 seconds here. Okay, Anand repairs his pawn structure, he plays knight d4. So these two guys are going to be by the side of each other, reunited, pawns reunited. <laughs> okay, so e takes, c takes. Now, re as a reunited unit, they're already threatening like things like d5, further cramping this poor bishop, which is already cramped because all these pawns prevent these entry points. Okay, so if d5, then maybe d6 as well, a follows sorry, B follows A. So, so this pawn mass over here, maybe herded by these two bishops, sets the scene for the game. Knight B C6, Queen C3, no rush to do anything. D5 um, is on the cards, it's been prepared slowly, the Queen had to move anyway, so keeps an eye on that A5. So black's always kind of tangled during this game it seems. Knight E7, and now not the immediate d5, white can slowly prepare for it, it doesn't need to allow a knight, a knight or bishop sack for two pawns, he can play just rook fd1, supporting d5. So total, you know, dynamism demonstrated here. Um, you know, one of black's pieces is not that good at the moment. Okay, rook ad8, and now another nice move, just working with the new pawn structure configuration, this bishop is a bit passive, just supporting d4. The queen's queen and rook are supporting d4, so maybe the bishop's free, and it is free to intensify the dark square pressure within black's position on this diagonal. This next move, bishop f2, echoes that. So just coming to that sensitive diagonal where black has no dark square bishop, dark square weaknesses to exploit, immediately threatening to win the knight as well if the queen ever moved after bishop g3 hitting that queen, asking it, you know, how are you going to defend a5? So black reacts now with a6 hitting the bishop, which means, okay, black's under fierce tactical pressure now. Bishop g3, he's relying on ab5 for the moment uh, to defend the knight indirectly. So queen a5, ab5. Okay, the bishop retreats, renewing that threat now. So how is black defending the knights though? Because there's always this big d5 push. Knight c6, there'll be d5. And it's supported by the rook on d1. Let's have a quick engine check on this position. Couldn't the knight have just gone like this? Now, is is there still a piece sack for back? Is d5 indeed the strongest move here? No. That's the key point about this position, guys. If you were naturally thinking d5 here, you're wrong. Because I'm engine checking this position. You can keep the tension a bit more, you know, further. You, no, no rush to play d5 because you know d5 just allows a counter piece sack. You know bishop d5. Okay, you might have an advantage, but it's not as big as as uh, pushing it with great greater support of the rook. If there was less pressure from the rook on d8, that's the clue. How do you get the rook on d8 to exert less pressure on d4 so you can make d5 more effective? That's my question to you guys. Ten seconds to find the move with that theme. You want to support d5. But without actually supporting it from, from behind, how can you uh, reduce black's pressure on the d4 pawn? 10 seconds now. Okay. There would be bishop d6 in this variation. Bishop d6, because then you've got d5 still. So say bishop d7, d5, you know, this is, this is intense now. You can just win a piece for a pawn, get one of your pieces back, and then carry on the pressure, you know, with rook a b1. Big advantage to white. So, okay. If we go back to the main uh, line of the game, so bishop f1, b6 was played. So maybe that's why. He didn't like the look of bishop d6. Maybe he'd spotted that. But rook a b1 keeps all the pressure on, just threatening rook takes b6, again threatening then queen takes a5. So this, this central pawn mass, what has it been doing? 
after it's been repaired, it wasn't just repaired for the sake of being repaired. It's this venomous bishop on the dark squares, I think, and the b-file pressure on the knight on a5 is a clear exploitable target so far. So black's getting a bit fed up here. In fact, he's got no choices really. He can't play b5, he'll just lose it. He can't play queen c7, just rook b6, knight b7, rook b6. And, you know, what's going to happen after that is terrible. You know, there'll be things like c6 and d5. We'll have three connected pass pawns, you know, just, just crushing black down the center. So black gets desperate. He gives up two minor pieces for a rook, which is not a good, good news. Rook takes b3. So, so this knight b3 invites uh, rook takes b3. So queen takes b3. Okay, there's a pawn for it here. But now d5. So we've got a different scenario. These two pawns are dangerous, in particular this one. But uh, these two bishops are really nasty now, uh, working together on the light and dark squares. Black plays knight g6, and now queen b6, and a6 is now dropping off. c5 is vulnerable. Black lashes out with f5. Doesn't really help. So another pawn is going. And then bishop b5, so keeping an eye on c5, but improving the bishop a bit. Okay, but first, before taking on c5, don't want to allow black to play fe with pressure down the f file. Keep that pawn on f3, so e takes f5 is played. Hitting the knight, not giving black too many options again. Queen takes f5, and now queen takes c5. So let's evaluate the situation here materially. White has five pawns, three pawns up for the exchange. Pretty nasty stuff. Um, can't obviously play d6 immediately, loses queen. He just slowly prepares stuff like d6 or even the a pawn. So rook c8 is played queen d4. Why not support d6 like that, but first maybe even a4. So rook f d8, and now just a4. And things are looking pretty grim for black. I'm not sure if he lost on time or just resigned, but the position does seem quite dire here. No no pressure on the f of that pawn. I think it will take too long to get to the seventh rank. These rooks are never going to really work together. As soon as you start moving this d8 rook, then d6, d7. And these bishops, you know, are, are quite dangerous working together on these two diagonals. So, it's 1-0 here. I think, I assume that black did resign. There's just three pawns to the exchange, and there's really no counterplay here to look forward to. Now that the bishop on a on b5 is supported, let's, let's just give an engine line to see a possible continuation from this position. Okay, we know, we know white's material up, and has got a lot of exciting possibilities, but let's try and put this in concrete. How could the game have continued according to uh, Ribka? Okay, let's say black plays queen f6. We could have bishop c4, threatening d6 check. Okay. Um, now, in, in, in a queen's off scenario, this looks even a simpler job. So a5, now threatens a6 with the bishop supporting it. So a6. So white's able to grow the advantage quite comfortably now. d5 is also supported. Now this bishop could reroute, say. And let's keep... All right, let's put the rook somewhere. Can we not just put it... Oh, we have to keep... the, the No, we have to keep the bishop supported. So rook e4, say. Check. So this kind of position... White will be making progress with the A pawn. Say rooks came off. Then again, the A pawn could prove the size of uh, A7. Because now there's always like bishop F2 to support it and bishop B5 to C6. So say rook A8, bishop F2. Okay, now, okay, the knight can temporarily defend some key squares. Bishop A4. Now in this kind of scenario, so the knight's kind of virtually pinned now because of d6, so it can't move from there. And in fact can be dislodged now. And then here, like d6 would do. Uh, just just being a you know, piece up. So we see in this example continuation that the A-pawn could be decisive. You know, white white's just steadily growing his advantage. 
This is a bit like the ending I had in Over the Wall game, which I, I chicken out of playing because of the history of the game. But here, you know, this, is, this was deliberately played for. This, I mean, he's three pawns to the exchange. Massive compensation for being the exchange down in, the, in this final position. Where Black, I assume, had, had resigned. Uh, so, so basically, I think that's the, the key idea. White can, you know, it doesn't matter about the queens coming off. The A pawn is going to play a decisive role here, herded by the bishops. I think, in a nutshell. Okay, let's let's go over the game again. And so, it's a revitalization actually. This tournament as a whole of the knight c3 move. So we're back to really exciting stuff. You know, maybe people are getting fed up of this Queen's Indian territory, this knight f3. So we see this deliberate fragmentation of pawn structure and f3 deliberate lagging behind the development to force off um, that bishop to get dynamic compensation. Deliberately, de you know, f you know, deliberately fragmenting the pawn structure here, but an entirely new idea, I think, not seen before, or not seen in such a high-level tournament, of giving up a whole knight to repair the structure, to restore its dynamism, and to make it hero out of the dark square bishop. At the moment, this e pawn is also knocked out on that sensitive diagonal. So knocking out that pawn intensifies the pressure massively when the bishop can occupy that diagonal. So it's a bit like in the French defense winner lines that uh, Fisher used to play. You know, you play a3, you encourage the double pawns, and then the bishop was getting on that diagonal in the winner lines. But here it's not this diagonal, it's this diagonal. So sort of, um, you know, c complementary dark square diagonal that you'd want to occupy if you had a powerful bishop and the opponent didn't have a powerful bishop. In the French defence winner, you know, Black's giving up his dark square bishop, with, you know, bishop takes c3, but here, okay, we've got a dark square bishop that Black doesn't have. So occupying this diagonal seems like a very logical idea. And trying to steamroll, potentially, but not impatiently, I think that's the key thing. Uh, you know, because there's always, you know, bishop d5, uh, d bishop d6 and d5, and also this knight to be exploited. There's a few other things in this position to make just the threat of d5 that much more painful. So rook a b1, and black immediately gave up uh, material now because of this painfully uh, placed knight. Okay, so now after after this, you know, the exchange down, but uh, white's advantage um, at the moment it was only for for two pawns, six pawns, one two three, no, just one pawn here. But big threats, you know, this queen b6, you know, a6, this this bishop on f1 and bishop on g3, really, really powerful bishops here. So, from this position, you know, black starts to lose pawns basically because these two guys are not that uh, that easy to defend. Okay, so he loses one, then he, he loses the other, so he's like three pawns uh, down for the exchange. And and in this position, you know, um, was it after Queen takes c5? You know, he, I think he resigned. Okay. Um, hope you enjoyed that. It's a way of dynamically repairing your pawn structure in the Nimzo Indian. So maybe you'd want to consider the the, the, the main line um, Nimzo, the old main line, instead of this Queen's Indian territory as white, and even Simish's move. You know, this f3 move. Uh, to be kick, you know, kicking the bishop with a3 later. So deliberately, you're, you're fragmenting your pawn structure. You're deliberately going down in development. So breaking quite a few rules to dynamically kind of um, undo some of those theoretical weaknesses and bring out your trump cards later, which, which includes this massive dark squared bishop. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.